Howdy, folks. Thank you for tuning in for another podcast. Now, this portion is brought to you by several companies. The first one I want to talk to you about is Veteran Innovative Products. Been using this company for a long time. Now, they have several products. I want to discuss it with you. That uh, the one that I personally use is the Veteran, the hundred grain version. Now, this is used for both compound and crossbow use. The blades are surgical steels cut down to 0.035 scalpel sharp blades. Now, the cutting width is from an inch and a quarter up to two and a half inches. They made a much heavier version at 175 grains. Now, getting heavier allowed them to use a higher quality steel, making it dang near indestructible. And they they also are coming with a 175 grain practice point as well. They carry the Atom as another one, the Guillotine Broadhead, the Hog Log. You can check these guys out at their website, VeteranIP.com, along with their Instagram page. The next company is MV Outdoors and Hunting. This brand is built on strength, perseverance, and determination. Now, they offer a full line of apparel and accessories. Now, their commitment is to those that are never willing to accept defeat. Now, you can check these guys out on their Instagram at MV Outdoors and Hunting. They also have a website, too. Use our exclusive code, WISEGUYS, for 10% off. They have a great selection of outerwear and layering. So check out their website and use Wise Guys for 10% off your entire order. Next one is the company that we go through for our decals. Their name of the company is Cajun Unicorns Designs. Now they customize anything and everything. You can check out them out on Facebook and Instagram. Check out what they have an option and what they've been able to accomplish. And they also add a taste of the Southern Life to your product. Now the last product I use out in the field, it's Cook's Fatal Attracted. You can learn more about the product and the company off of Where to Hunt, episode 54. It's getting inside the buck's head. This is where Rich Cook, the owner, sits down with Eric, and he teaches him how to and when to use certain scents and also to when to use them as a combination during the hunting season and in the off season. Now, the products that I used is the Dominant Buck, and I also used their certified Peak Doe and Estrogen, and I got I get the four-inch bottles. Now, they're shipped in the U.S. for free, anywhere, so it's great. Well, lower 48, I should say, in the continent of the USA. Now, you can check out the results on Instagram. It's their proof of is in the pudding. Now, you can go to their website at cooksdeerscent.com for their full array of products. Now, the po- first I'm sitting down with this podcast is Anthony Schmidt. He owns Schmidt string- Bow Strings, and they m- makes a very high-quality string. I personally use them myself. I have nothing but high remarks about their high-quality technology they throw into their bow strings. And if you are local, you can go to La Crosse Archery in La Crosse, Wisconsin, to have your new strings placed on your new bow. And you can also check them out at smittiesbowstrings.com and also at lacrossearchery.com as well. Thank you. Without further ado, here is the podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so I am here with Mr. Anthony Schmidt. He owns the Lacrosse Archery facility here, the only one actually in the area when it comes down to it. You get to a place to actually be able to shoot your bow indoors, at least. Now, being here in Wisconsin, we have a lot of open public land to go hunting on and shooting our bows, so there's always an opportunity. Now, Anthony here, his one of his biggest accomplishments is his bow, spr- bow string. So why don't you break down a little bit of your DNA and how this all came about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so lacrosse archery, we've been here for 10 years. Uh, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary back in, in June and July. You know, so it's funny to look back on the string company and how things have evolved and certainly what's got us here. But, you know, first if we uh, we backstep a little bit to 10 years ago, you know, the Matthews DXD was the bow. Okay. Uh, the Hoyt Alpha Max was the bow that came out just after we opened up. Uh-huh. And that, that really shook the ground in the industry. Okay. You know, it seems like uh, 
right now, the way we live in our world, it seems like every two to three years, some pretty crazy things happen. Within That's very true. Those. It is. Um, and within crossbows, and there's so many other things changing. Uh, but 10 years ago, things happened every four or five. A mm-hmm. little bit slower. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are less people involved in bow hunting and less people involved in target archery, and, and things just grew and developed. So what um, do you think really uh, accelerated the, the change from every one to every, about every five years down to that three-year mark? You know, so it's funny you ask that, too, but really when you think about it, we all have a limited amount of free time. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of us go to work for 40 or 50 hours a week, and then we come home and we spend time doing the things that we want to do. And there's always too many options. You know, we can go hit a bucket of balls, we can go golfing, we can go shoot archery. Mm-hmm. You know, we can do so many different things, yeah. but when it comes down to archery, it's more of a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, when you talk about Bucks of America and Bucks of Wisconsin, you know, this is what we do not only three months out of the year, but it's what we do for our entire 12 months. That's very true. It is our lifestyle because all I do is eat, breathe, and, s- and sleep, right. hunting, the outdoors, politics, what's going on, right. going on right now. And it's like, I'm staying down with you. I'm pretty curious because you have a lot more experience because I've only been bow hunting since 2015. And just what's been going on right now from my short career is just amazing. The new Triax shoots like a, a dream. The Power Max, the, the RX1s, it's, it's night and day different from when I first started with my, my uh, Hoyt Factor 34. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, when you ask the question, you know, what, have, what has changed? You know, I think Matthews was the big developer when it came to establishing culture within the sport. Okay. You know, they were the first company that came out with the switchback. You remember that in 2005? And then the DXT, you know, this is, it dates me, it's a few years ago, but mm-hmm. they really created a culture around not only a weapon, because before archery and, and bow hunting, it was a one-sided sport and a uh-huh. few of a shot target archery, but really when it came down to it, um, there's much more bleed over between a recreational archer and a, and a bow hunter now. Okay. And we're seeing more people get involved for different activities and different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, men that come in with their wives and with their two or three kids and they all shoot archery together. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I grew up working here as a part-time team member, it was a completely different atmosphere. We had the 54-year-old dude that came in to get away from his family. He uh-huh. just wanted to go shoot in the range and then go up for a few beers after. Okay. Now it's a completely different experience and environment. It's a different relationship with our customers too. Yeah. Now we have families coming in and we have uh, women coming in that um, are single just to shoot archery. Uh, just that's because that's they nice. Enjoy the sport. Yeah. That's good that you have that type of environment to bring in females to do this because you can almost create your own ladies' night. You know, next thing you know, it's like guys are guys and gals are meeting, and all of a sudden, hey, we're getting married. Right. It's fun too. We actually have our own women's uh, league in Hunters League. So throughout the winter, when we start up in, Jul- in January. We have a 10-week league that runs all the way through with Reinhardt Animal Targets. Okay. We just make it a big hunting scene, and every week it's a little bit different. You'll see it this winter, too. Yes. I'm um, looking forward to it because I finally yeah. got a job where I can have nights off. Have some flexibility. Crazy mm-hmm. concept, right? Yeah, no kidding. More time for the podcast. Yeah, more time for everything. <laughs> uh, but really, it, it's fun because we have different groups of people that are all enjoying it for different reasons, but mm-hmm. we're all here for the same reason, too. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's romantic, you know, when you think about it that way. You know, archery has changed so much. Um, but to circle back on that too, you know, even when we started the string company years and mm-hmm. years ago, uh, that was back in what, 2017 or 2018. Okay. We get, or 2006, 2007, we got into this to change the product development. Okay. And bows, uh, were so much different, less efficient, not quite as quiet. And the strings and cables certainly were not at the, the style and peak that they are now too. Oh, gotcha. So things have changed, uh, with strings and cables to make things uh-huh. that much better. You know, our peep sites don't twist anymore. We don't have strings and cables that stretch. That okay. way we don't have houndage and we don't have the conversation with somebody that we're shooting four inches low all of a sudden. And why is that? Okay. Yeah. So that was a common thing then you were, what it were, a string would eventually wear out after how long? Oof. Um, years ago, you could probably get 500, 2,000 shots out of it. You'd always have that standard guy that would have his, have his bow string for 14 years. <laughs> you know, it's the same guy that's had tires on his truck for 15. Somehow. I gotcha. And they're still yeah. rolling. Uh-huh. Uh, the big reason why we got into this is because we were very specific target archers at that point. Uh-huh. We just didn't want to have peep sight issues. If we threw our bow case in the back of our vehicles, we drove to South Dakota, or we drove to Oregon and, and went on a, a shoot in a tournament, we okay. wanted to make sure that we just didn't have a challenge with our peep sight. We yeah. wanted to make sure our cables didn't rotate. Uh-huh. We wanted to make sure we just didn't have issues. So we came at this from the custom line of things. All right. It's no different than really setting up a, a custom bicycle or even a custom set of uh, golf clubs. Uh, really when it comes down it. to it, we it want to make sure it's perfect to the end user. Uh, in the same point, it's not perfect to everybody, but it's perfect to your setup. So mm-hmm. everything that we do as a string company at Schmitty Specialty Strings is custom to order. So as soon as we get an email from a retailer or for a consumer, uh, we jump on it, build uh-huh. a custom to their setup, 
uh-huh. custom colors, and it goes out the door for them. All right. Yeah. So now, when you been working with this string, I, I don't want to get into your, into your, te- your techniques and how you created this uh, uh, unique string. But um, how long? So you started. You said you started this back in '07. Now, at ten years into your build, how do you like the new technology? Like, like. Did, now, do you got do you strictly carry here in lacrosse, or do you branch out to other shops? So we branch out to other shops. So um, Schmidty Specialty String is a manufacturer that's located inside of lacrosse archery. Okay. Uh, but we're two completely separate businesses. Okay. Uh, you know, so the idea is is that we are a manufacturer that ships out to other retailers similar to lacrosse archery. Mm-hmm. So we'll ship out to different private retailers that are all, all over our state, all over the Midwest, all the way from New York and Hawaii. We've shipped product to 18 different countries, retailers in those countries. Wow. It's amazing how diverse and how much requirement there is for a high-end product, too. But at the same time, we're not a high production manufacturer. So we're oh. not we're not building 4,000 Matthew switchback sets a year because that's not what we do well, and we understand that. Mm-hmm. But we service that individual dealer and customer per order exceptionally well. And that's what we take our pride in. Makes sense. It's yeah. way more, it's more um, dedicated. So this way, when somebody's getting that high quality, it's not mass produced. It's for that one person. Now, don't, I don't mean to name drop, but who else uses your, do you have any famous archers that use your product? We do. Oh, boy. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of different people. Um, a few that it would probably be best not named. Uh, we have a lot of professional archers that are under contract oh, with the okay. bow manufacturer, and it, it allows them to only shoot the manufacturer's strings. Uh huh. So it's probably safe that we just fair enough. The names. I, yeah. I, get, I get behind that. Yep. I understand it completely. Yeah. Yep. So because yeah, you never you don't want them because it's like they may have their their bow that they use professionally, but then they also have their personal bow too. Yeah, it just puts and, everybody in bad spots. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it completely on that. So now, last year I was watching you. I was trolling you, and I was looked at you. Went out to Redding, California. Tell me about that event because when I saw it, you were there's like over 3,000 people there, and it's a multiple-day event. Give me the atmosphere. Give me a breakdown. Like, when you walk in, when you park your vehicle, you're walking up. To, give me a, a picture. Well, so here's the deal, Jeff. So since 1994, 1995, we've been traveling all over the country shooting state and sectional and national tournaments, and it's been a blast. We've experienced so much with so many different people. Mm-hmm. The Reading Archery Shoot was the first time that I've ever been there, and it mm-hmm. was the time of my life. Okay. You know, if there's ever an archery tournament that you have to put on a bucket list, this would be the one and only tournament. Okay. And I've experienced a lot of different shoots with a lot of awesome people. But really when it came down to Redding, flying out to Eugene, Oregon, we took a few tours of the Bowtech uh-huh. Archery Plant, rented a car, and we drove south, and we, we down to Redding, California. And down there, it's a giant volunteer-based archery club. Okay. I'm not sure how many members they have, but it's hundreds and hundreds. Wow. And they have just a ton of targets set up through their course, through rolling hills, very similar to what we have here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the walking is more difficult, and the archery is more difficult, too, but there's targets labeled all the way out to 100 yards. It's all 3D animal targets that okay. have an orange dot. So the neat part is now, if you're a hunter, you're very familiar with the outline of an animal and probably mm-hmm. a little bit more comfortable shooting that. True. Uh, but personally, as a target archer, I'm much more comfortable shooting at a dot. Okay. Uh, something a little bit more specific. Mm-hmm. So it's the best of both worlds, and it's known distance. Uh, what's not known is the wind between here and a 94-yard target. Right? True, true. Uh, what's not known is the angle that you have to cut your sight tape for. Okay. And the conversation goes, if you're shooting a target at, at 40 yards, and it's at a 14-degree downhill, you have to subtract a, a significant amount of yardage. You might have to shoot that target for 35 or 36 yards. Oh, interesting. So now, when you go out, is, is it all strictly by sight, or can you use range finders? You can still use range finders, and it is marked on your scorecard. So if you're shooting target number 14, you look at your scorecard, and that does correlate with the distance, too. Oh, really? So this way, it's kind of like uh, your own golf score, because this way it yeah. tells you what the par is going to be. Right. It's very unique. Yep. Now, uh, you said you guys do your own thing. Do you guys sponsor any bigger events besides what you do here in the shop? So we've done a lot of different uh, winter-style events, too, and we, we support a lot of our local 3D clubs, too. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to, to support them as much as we can without being hands in the deck involved. Uh, okay. We have so many different archery clubs in our area. I can name eight or nine off the top of my head that have such a strong support base with their volunteers. Uh-huh. You know, a check here and there, um, you know, sending our staff over there to, to participate and be part of it, that's huge. That's, that's a big Showing one. Our yeah, donating the labor is always Absolutely, huge. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we've put on different tournaments in the past, too, and we've hosted mm-hmm. Great Lakes Outdoor Sectional Tournament. 
So we'll have people from the Midwest, the best indoor archers in the entire Midwest, mm -hmm. come here and shoot a two-day tournament over the weekend during okay. the winter. That's amazing because you're witnessing the best archers in the Midwest and certainly the best archers in the country go head-to-head. -head. Oh, wow. I bet yeah. that's got to be interesting, especially the egos that come to the room and get you cut the tension with a knife. You know, it's no different than looking at professional athletes. You get some egos, some people that are, you know, bigger than the world, but truly mm -hmm. they are. You know, mm -hmm. they get to this point because they are confident. It's not an arrogance thing. They know they're good. They are good, but they need to keep that persona going too. So that's it's, a good point. It's really unique to be part of it and just to watch it. Um, I was never at that level, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fun to experience people that that are. And a lot of these people we've known for fifteen and twenty years. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah, you you carry both Matthews and Hoyts. Now, as you were mentioning earlier, that the the, the technology has jumped it a lot, but I want to touch base on the kids because kids is where our future is going to be in the sport and how we're going to pass down to public lands. And our heritage too. So, how do you, since you started back in ninety one, how how uh, how big is the, uh, the the population of kids in this area? Oof. So when I started, um, I was I started when I was three years old in nineteen ninety one. Mm -hmm. um, to put a perspective on it, I was a kid growing up in elementary school, middle school, and high school, and I was maybe one of two or three kids that were in my my high school graduating class of one hundred and thirty people. Okay, I shot archery. Okay. You know, we did that archery in the schools program that Matthew started maybe 20 years ago, and that's developed more kids into archery, into hunting uh -huh. uh, than anybody else ever has, and it's been an incredible program. But even at that, 15, 20 years ago, no one shot archery as okay. compared to now. Mm -hmm. And now we have almost 2,000 kids a year that go through our park and rec programs, our 4-H programs, our birthday parties, our team building events. It's incredible. It's a lot people. of kids, and and no, for those who don't know, Lacrosse, Wisconsin, is we only sit in about what, fifty six thousand people, maybe sixty thousand people. It's at that not, it's not a big community. Yeah, it's not a very big. And so hearing about two thousand kids, it's like that's a lot, and that's a really good thing. It's they're they're putting bows in their hands, not Xbox controllers in their in their in their hands, you know. Right. So which shows that the parents are getting more involved, and they're keeping them from being inside to outside, mm -hmm. showing them, giving them life experience. You you don't develop memories in front of a TV, right? No, without a doubt. You develop memories with family. You develop memories with friends. Mm -hmm. um, comes back to archery being a recreational sport, but it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a weapon to kill things specifically. I enjoy doing that. Yeah. This is a lifestyle that we can use 12 months out of the year, and that's what makes archery fun. I guess That's you. why we keep doing it. Very cool. Now, what? So, so since you've been hunting, or since you've been in archery so long, how many bows do you got? Oh, man. How many bows have I owned over the past 15 years? So since we've been here at the store, I probably have three to four bows a year. Okay. Um, you know, we're a, a big Matthews, Bowtech, and Hoyt retailer, and I've owned all the brands and all the styles, it seems like. And I always have my favorites, you know, and some of that's depending on how much coffee I drink in a day, too, or how strong <laughs> I'm feeling. It, it, yeah. It's so true, but it's it's such a blessing having such a strong relationship with all of our manufacturers mm -hmm. across the board because it allows us to try different things. And certainly when people come in the store and they say, well, what's the best bow? You can't answer that truthfully. It's very true. Yeah, we all have opinions, mm -hmm. um, but an opinion is about as far as we can get. You really have to experience each brand for what it is, because there's a right and a wrong bow that fits you too. That's very true. Because see, now when I first started shooting, like, and people ask me what my thoughts are, because it's like I talk about it, I hunt quite frequently, but I tell them it's like you got to get your hand, you got to get a bow in your hand, because it's like I may not like a bow tech, but all of a sudden you love it because it fits great, the vibration feels good. So it's like I tell anybody that if they're going to shoot a bow or get into archery, go out and go find a dealer the nearest to you and shoot as many as you possibly can because mm -hmm. you may find that a $400 bow fits you better than a $1,000 bow, you know? Well, so, and let's call it what it is, too. You know, there's there was a time and a place where retailers would only have one bow brand on the shelf, and that's so mm -hmm. limiting to the consumer because it doesn't mm -hmm. provide options. Yeah. You know, just imagine if you had to drive to a car dealership and buy one truck. Yeah. But now you can look at a, a Toyota Tundra, you can look at a Chevy Silverado and a Ford F-150 in the same dealer lot, mm -hmm. all 2019. So, you know, it'd be like the best day ever Yeah, no if kidding. you wanted to drop 60 grand. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. So, now with aero technology, how does, what, um, what, that can, what the, that's what I'm looking for here. So, when you, when you set up a bow with your string, like, have you, do you have a, an idea on what arrows pair up best with you? Because I know the thickness of the string can play a role in the knock travel do you, do you, is there one that, that the string tends to favor more over the other or a certain grainage too? Yeah. So it's unique when you bring up, you know, product model years. You know, everything comes out October, November, that time of year. Mm -hmm. Once we receive the new bows, and the nice thing about having these three brands in our store and having relationships with other brands that we don't stock here is that we disassemble the bow as soon as it comes in. Mm -hmm. Bef you know, before we do anything, we set the bow to spec, make sure that's perfect, and we disassemble strings and cables. We take a micrometer to it and map everything out. 
mm-hmm. it's important to have a pretty good baseline. Okay. So without an accurate baseline, without balancing your wheels in your truck, it's hard to get good, ga- good gas mileage. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure it's a quiet, smooth ride. You know, all these mm-hmm. things are very true mm-hmm. and comparable within a compound mode too. So once we disassemble, once we map it out and create a new string and cable for it, now we have a platform to start off on. Okay. With arrows, there's been more technology in arrows the past five years, arguably, than I would say bows. Mm-hmm. There's so much more that can happen to an arrow now uh, that can happen anywhere across uh, anywhere across anything. So mm-hmm. if you talk mm-hmm. about anything relative to long-range rifle shooting with different bullets, uh, different ballistic yeah. capabilities. It's amazing when you look at an arrow, you can find a specific arrow for a specific purpose. Okay. And when guys are looking at shooting a whitetail at 27 yards or looking at shooting an elk at 57, mm-hmm. it's a completely different setup. Mm-hmm. You know, can you get something that's adequate for everything? Of course. Can you get something that's perfect for one thing? Uh-huh. Certainly can too. That's good. So that's yeah. good that, that you're, that you found that you, there's no one model that the arrow, because I, I know, like when you when certain guns, like I, I shoot more guns than I do bows, but I found that certain brands for the bar- for the the, ball, the barrel match seems to be a little bit different depending on what I shoot from, whether it be uh, Winchester, Remington, or that. So it's like, okay, well, that's good to know for the the common consumer out there listening to this podcast. They let you know is that there's no you you can work, everything's very um, fluid. You don't have to worry about picking one over the other, which is great to understand that too. Uh, what I'd like to know more about is the, uh, like, so now, and you don't, do you have kids yet or not? I don't. Okay. So, what would I, what would you do to, how, how would you introduce a young child into archery? So it needs to be part of a habit. You know, it's so the one thing that we've known about kids is that more is seen and taught than mm-hmm. said and taught. Okay. So one thing that I notice for a lot of parents that come in, you can say one thing to your kids and see if they they follow that path. Uh, but if you're doing that thing, that they'll pay attention a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Relative within any habit that we do as adults, um, you know, if if losing weight is a habit, yeah, we're eating a bag of Cheetos. They're probably not going to take it super seriously. True. Either. And I True. love my Cheetos, Jeff. Mm-hmm. But the reality of it is, is if we make archery a habit, and that's a passion that the parents, the mom or the dad share, the kids will share that to you. So if we want to get more kids into it, we need more parents. We need more people that are engaged in archery, not specifically hunting. Hunting is the next step. Yes, true. But we need archers first. You know, once we uh, establish an archer, then we have more of a hobby. So now, so who got you into archery then? When you were at through, was it your mom or was it your dad? Both. Both. Yeah, okay. So yep, in the early '90s, everyone in our family shot archery. Wow. Yeah. So my grandpa started everything in the '60s. Uh, okay. He was, he was bow hunting on the family land that we still have now. Mm-hmm. Uh, before there were any white tails on it, <laughs> yeah, well, that's good to see the hit have it. See, my dad was never big into archery; he was more into muzzle. But I, like, I kind of drew to the same thing. I like that one shot, one kill. Because, like, granted, it's like you could reload a muzzle faster than you can do with a bow. But you know, it's it's that whole one shot, one kill aspect to it. And we all have our memorable shots. But that's good that your grandpa started so young. See, my grand when I was when I was growing up, my grandpa never. He was, getting, he was on his way out of hunting, so I wasn't able to relate that with him. So it's nice to hear that 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 that, uh, that tradition still holds true in your family as well as mine. Because my uh, little one, she's five, and so I got her a bow a couple years ago, and now it's like she's getting a little bit more. Her dexterity has gotten better, mm-hmm. but she she's ambidextric, so I don't know what bow to buy her sure. for her next step. Because I've noticed that she, like I, she right now she's shooting left handed, but next bit I know she was shooting like the year before she was shooting right. So. It's very hard to figure that out, and so what? As a parent, as a new parent, that's, that just have that's, that's their child's coming up at the age five, six, seven. What is a good year to like start putting a um, finding out what their dominant eye is? How can you really which one really really focus on most? Yeah, so you know, I started when I was three. Um, a lot of people start when they're six and seven. A lot of kids do, mm-hmm. um, but really by the time kids hit age eight, their attention span lengthens a little bit. Usually, okay. they had one or two years back in elementary school too, so at least they're used to a little bit more instruction, or at least a little bit more um, uh, guardrails in their life, you know, for mm-hmm. lack of a better phrase. So okay. as far as eye dominance, we establish that at about six or seven. We can find that out pretty quick. Um, eye dominance generally doesn't change, uh, but before age five, usually it's a hard thing to describe to Which a kid. Which makes sense them, now for me. Have them absorb it, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I would say by six, you know, we can figure a lot of that stuff out. Very nice then. So that's, that's good to know because, like, I had something learned I didn't know either myself because I did because, like, I was... I didn't really pay attention to my eye dominance until I was in 10 when, when, when I started getting handed down firearms to, to figure out what is going to be best suited for myself. Now, 
let's move into a little bit of a hunting here. So what is you, you so you, you, I take a white tail as your bread and butter, right? Yeah. But so what is your, what's been your favorite, your most memorable hunt? Without a doubt, it was about four or five years ago. Uh, my dad and I went to Saskatchewan on a bear hunt. Oh, I bet that'd have been fun. Oh, so we, uh, we found out about this guy through a buddy that used to work here too. And um, I've always wanted to see a color phase black bear. Okay. I just think it's the most gorgeous thing in the world. And why would you not want a rug of that in your house? And no kid. So mm-hmm. it was a 26 hour drive. It was a crazy drive. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, we get up there, uh, we drove straight through. Um, on the way back, we had to take a few pit stops and get some sleep for sure. But once we get up there, it's a completely different world. Okay. And I've been to Ontario a couple times too, bear hunting. Uh, that's gorgeous and it's a beautiful area. But there's something different about spring bear hunting in Saskatchewan, a place that you've never explored. Okay. You know, there's just flat out say it, there's so many fewer people up there than there are even in Ontario. That is very true. I, I listen to a lot of Grady Bowman. I listen to just finishing up a podcast where he just got done with the bear hunt, but continue. Yeah, for sure. So it was it was unique in the respect that I've never hunted bears in the ground. Okay. In the open. Ooh, in, intimidating. In, in a pine bough made ground blind. So this is day three. My dad and I are actually hunting in the same ground blind together. Mm-hmm. Uh, the guy that we're hunting with has cameras up, and he's got a, uh, a just a beautiful caramel color black chocolate face. Okay. It's, it's gorgeous bear. And a bunch of other bigger black bears, too. And, All right. Uh, we ended up getting in there. It's about a mile and a half road trip back on a uh-huh. four wheeler, and I have to drop uh-huh. my dad off along with bait. Up there, you can you can bait with live, not live, but you can bait with the dead animal carcasses. Oh, interesting. So we had half frozen beavers. Smart. So, yeah, for sure. So during the winter, this guy would trap beaver. Okay. Throw them in a freezer. Okay. Um, once everything started up, May and June, he would actually unthaw the beavers halfway and then keep them in the fridge. So they just smell absolutely terrible. Well, yeah, exactly. The bears love it. It's, they're like, yeah. hey, this is brunch. It's perfect. So by the time 2 or 3 o'clock happens, we're out in the blind. I drop my dad off, and I have to go back another quarter mile, drop the four-wheeler off, and then come back in. Okay. So it's probably about an hour, hour and a half into the hunt, and I see this color phase chocolate coming in. It's just gorgeous. You know, the sun's coming down right on the bear, and it's just glowing. Okay. It's it's the most unique thing ever when you're 35 yards away from a bear on the ground. All right. That's bigger than you, and you're sitting <laughs> on a chair. Okay. With a stick and a string. So it's walking around, uh, sees the bait, and ends up walking around our blind and does a circle. And it's closer than me and you away. So Ooh. for the audience that's listening, Jeff and I are five and a half feet away. Mm-hmm. This bear is three feet away from my face. I'm freaking out. I look over Ooh. at my dad, and he's... Like stone cold killer, like he's ready uh-huh. to rock. Uh-huh. Um, I'm tweaking out a little bit. Uh, the bear walks in front of the blind, and in the front of the blind, there's an opening that we shoot through. And okay. it's just a standard V. It might be a foot and a half wide by a foot and a half or two feet tall. Okay. It gets up on its hind legs and trashes the front of the blind with its front paws. Wow! So I'm dead on the ground having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. It walks out to the bait. I pull okay. back. I put my top pin on it, pull the trigger. That's okay. all I remember. So wow. we got it on video. Uh, it was intense and crazy. I've never experienced anything like that in the woods ever. I would never planned to again. You know, with a black <laughs> bear, uh-huh. um, it's a cl- completely different experience. I've never shared an experience with a grizzly. It's certainly completely different. But, I bet. Uh, it knew something. So now, in, we were hunting in Saskatchewan. Did, no, is it known to have grizzlies there as well? I'm not sure. You know, we didn't okay. talk about grizzlies at all. I don't think it is. Okay, because I, I know like uh, certain areas out there, because now it's the... the, the uh, the grizzly population's gotten pretty big. Some of those black bears get pretty mean. I mean, they because they have to also compete against these guys too. So it's like, what do you do? Do you do you stand up against it or do you run around, run right. away? And of course, there's always an ego involved. So you got to take care of that. Now, when you went on a spear hunt, like what did you use for like the the grain arrow type? Was it how big? How heavy was it? So the, the big part about what I'm doing now, it's I only shoot 62 pounds, at least I did back then, but the arrow was 500 grains. Okay. Um, I take a different approach to, to arrows and, and building now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my recommendation is always to shoot as many pounds as you're comfortable shooting. True. Um, where I'm at right now is in the low 70s, uh-huh. but my arrows are seven are 650 grains. Okay. They're super heavy, but they've got a ton of momentum. Especially for your FOC, especially to get that higher probability of a yeah. pass-through. And in no world is, is less, less FOC better. Um, as long as you know your distance and that distance is established, so okay. if that animal is at 27 yards, you know what it is, you can set your sight to that distance, Okay. you will always have more energy passing through the animal, and you'll, you'll certainly not have any deflection shots, at least a lot less likely. Yeah. You know, the more FOC and the more front of center um, arrow weight that you have in the tip okay. of that arrow, you're a lot less likely to hit and then deflect. So if you do hit a rib, if you hit a shoulder, at least you're going to plop straight rather than take the easiest path around that ah. into the guts. So that's that's my idea on heavyweight arrows. 
high apple sea arrows. Which makes sense because I've been I've been because I was listening to a podcast with Gertie Bowman. He was talking about that's like I wonder what my FOC is right now. It's like I was, I'm kind of curious about that because I I I thought about the weight one one what I shot yes last year with my. Uh, um, I shot my white tail with, and it wasn't not completely a pass through, but it passed through, it went up over the shoulder, straight through the double lung, and it stopped right on the other, on the other side of the lungs, out just, just bedded itself inside the, the rib cage. There, it's like, huh? So it's like, now, do you recommend the six fifty for for t- for like how big of an animal? I should say anybody that shoots over forty five pounds, um, six fifty is is the right way to go. Really? So, yeah, I started drinking this Kool Aid about three years ago. Uh huh. The Ashby Report. Um, it's a it's a really unique document um, that a, a doctor wrote about a single bevel solid lark broadhead, and also having 650 grains. Doesn't it? Didn't he do most of his studies out in Africa? He did. I yeah. just got his. I, I know yeah. exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember his name, but yeah. I don't know. Dude's, I, dude's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know. So there's there's so much more ability with the 650 grain arrow with a single bevel broadhead. Uh-huh. You can hit and plow and twist. Wow. Yeah. So. You know, a lot of people think a, a faster arrow is always better, and that's true if you don't have any friction to hit. You know, mm. if we're talking about a target that's at a, a variable distance, now our pin gaps aren't quite as important. Okay. You know, we can miss by a couple yards in our estimation of distance and know that our arrow is going to get there quicker, and it's not as relied on fixed distance. Okay. The issue with the heavy arrow is that you need to know the distance. That's very true. So now, one so when you're like going to have our speed go because they're they're sure. fast. Yeah. So what would be a recommended distance to put one through it? Oh, so... That at a 650 Yeah, FOC? so I was in South Dakota last week, or two weeks ago now. Okay. Um, I shot my goat at 81 yards. Wow! And that's 72 pounds, the 650 grain arrow. No kidding. So yeah. it's like it really doesn't really play. Pay. So it's, it's you knowing your equipment is what you're getting at. Right. That's pretty cool. So we're coming up on a half hour. I know you only only had a bit a little bit. So why don't you explain to the audience how they can get in touch with um, Smitty's um, bowstrings. Yeah. So uh, we're located here at Lacrosse Archery. That's always the easiest way to get a hold of me. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, through our website, ssstrings.com. It's a lot of S's. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've got a really cool color selector chart on there, too, that, that okay. showcases all of our colors. You can click on two colors and it twists those two colors up so you can actually visualize what you're getting before you, you push play on the Oh, board. smart. I like, yeah, I like that. Sure. Good marketing tool. you okay. you got to paint a picture. Otherwise, it's so hard to understand the 2,000 color choices difference. You know, <laughs> there's so many different, too many different choices. Really, when it comes down to it. But you know, the unique part about ordering the set of strings, too, at least here in the store, is we install everything. We shoot everything through paper and make sure that the cam lean is established and make sure that's set up the archer. And then you go on the range and shoot. You know, it's like the ultimate process of putting everything on, making sure it's tuned, going out in the woods. And, of course, you have recommended dealers that are, because you said you, you distribute throughout the United States, so you, you have a, a list of dealers on there as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. now, for the rest of the audience, we're, all this information will be put up on the RSS feed and along with that, and, and so this way you can be able to look all this information up because it's like, I don't shoot, I right now shoot winner's choice, but all my friends say, you got to go with the string because it's reliable, it's very consistent, and it doesn't let you down. It doesn't let you down. I'll pass the cooler over. We'll make that happen. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you, Anthony, for coming on. We'll talk to you guys later. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome.